and welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Are you bothered with tired, aching feet? Lots of people are. Dr. Fred Wolf, rheumatologist, once told me, Dr. Bob, your feet are your best friends and very slow to heal. We'll be spending most of this show talking about different foot problems. Bunions, calluses, corns, plantar fasciitis, diabetic foot care, flat feet, high hearts, lots and lots of questions. My guest is Dr. Kendall Ritchie. Dr. Ritchie is a board certified podiatrist and deals with foot problems every single day. He'll be answering our questions. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Overholt. I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes on the Dr. Bob Show. Later on, we'll be talking about signs and symptoms of anemia and cardiac ablation. Why are so many people needing ablation? What is it? What does the cardiologist do? And how much help do we get? Lots of information for you. You'll want to stay tuned. We're talking with Dr. Kendall Ritchie, board certified podiatrist, and we're going to be talking about foot problems. Kendall, welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Thank you, Dr. Bob. I'm honored to be here. Now, let's talk about bunions right off. Oh, okay. What is a bunion? Well, technically the word bunion means swelling or bump of bone. But that's a bit of a misnomer because it's a lot more than just a bump of bone. This is a structural change that happens in the front of your foot where the bones will start to separate. It will create a, a situation where your great toe wants to lean up onto your second toe wow. and then a bone prominence forms right over at the area at the base of the big toe. So you have an overgrowth of bone at the base of the big toe? Correct. And correct. the big toe begins to wiggle over it towards to the side? It wants to lean right towards the second toe. That's so correct. So is that painful? Well. Um, they can be extremely painful to the point where you can't find shoes that you can wear. Even if you go out and try to buy new shoes, they just don't make them wide enough. Um, or sometimes it's not painful at all. But the majority of time, because it is a progressive problem, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. It's eventually going to rub in the shoe and it's going to cause a lot of redness and swelling directly over the bump. So when somebody gets a bunion and their shoes, they can't find shoes that they can wear well, was it bad shoes that brought on the bunions? <laughs> well, that's a good question. I, I get asked that almost every single day. A woman will come in and say, oh, look what I've done to myself. I wore those wrong shoes. Uh, the truth of the matter is probably 90 to 95 percent of bunions are heredity. Just like you inherit dangling earlobes and high cheekbones, you inherit a structure of the foot which um, leads to the mechanical faults, which will cause the bunion. Um, <clears throat> there is an influence. So if you wear high-heeled shoes, if you work on your feet all day long, hard, solid surface, sports injuries, just all that kind of thing, it can add up and accelerate the process. But the majority of them come from hereditary reasons. So if you've got a bony overgrowth and the big toe is trying to climb over the other one, what do you do about it? What, what can be done? You just put a splint on there? What do you do? Well, there's two ways to look at it. You can do a conservative method, and mostly that's going to be seeking wider shoes. They make uh, an array of shields and splints and covers and things to protect the bump. Um, but when those fail, then obviously we're talking about a surgical correction. So what do you do surgery-wise? You saw off that bump? Do you pull the foot over? What do you have to do? Well, th that's a big part of it. Um, years ago, obviously, bunions were known as coming back. Uh -huh. um, now, as, as within the last 10, 20 years, we're really starting to understand the underlying mechanics that cause it. And so it's not just a simple, let's knock that bump off and, and go to the house. So the bump does come off. But we also have to realign that mechanical uh, distance that's happened in that foot. So. Um, a lot of times that means breaking the bone, push it back into the correct location, and then we use an array of screws and pins and plates and stuff to hold it in place while it heals. When, when you fix the bunion, uh, when you have to have surgery, 
What's the recovery time? How long does it take somebody to heal? Does it depend on their age, but let's just say somebody 62 and a half. 62 and a half, just a day older than me. So um, <laughs> it takes bone about eight to 10 weeks to be fully healed. So until someone can run, kick, jump, push on that foot, it's probably gonna be the better part of two, two and a half months. Um, but it's a progressive thing. And so usually after a month, people are getting around fairly comfortable in a loose supportive type shoe. Um, to address you, you're talking probably four to six months till they're back to normal activities. Uh, do you have to wear a walker shoe, one of those big boots we do. when you first start? We do. We start off with the walker early on. Yeah. Now, now, some of the real extreme bunions, we actually have to keep them off of the foot for a while. You might have seen people scooting around town on those little rolling knee scooters. Yes. Uh, we don't use as many crutches anymore. But for, for the most part, you're probably talking about wearing one of those large boots, maybe using a walker for a week or two. What's the long-term results if somebody has a bunion and it, it's been progressive and they didn't come in until things were really bad and you fix it up, how do they do a year later and two years later? What, what happens? Well, um, these procedures have become much more reproducible. And so what that means is we're getting better and better and better. Mm -hmm. And so long term, we're just not seeing so many actual recurrences as we used to. Does it change people's lives? Oh, Dr. Ritchie, thank you, thank you, thank you, because I no longer have this pain and I'm not having my, a grotesque looking big toe going yeah, over my... Yeah, that's, that's one of my favorite things. Bunions are something that you can visually see one minute and in the first post-operative visit, it's gone. That must be great. And it makes them feel so much better. Uh, yeah, that's a great part of medicine when you help somebody and they say thank you. Uh, let's talk about calluses and corns. Tell me what the difference of those two things are. Well, essentially, a callus and a corn is the same thing. It's the body's outer layer of skin called the epidermis. It's the response to pressure or friction. So a callus is a little bit more widespread and larger, usually under the ball of the foot or the heel, whereas corns, they're gonna be located on the top of the toe or in between the toes. Same exact phenomenon, different location. Corns are usually smaller and harder and a little bit more painful than calluses. Yeah, it seems like when I've seen, when I've had corns, it was an earlier age, and it seems like there was a center part of the corn that seemed to cause problems and a lot of pressure, a lot of pain, a lot yeah. of discomfort. Yeah, they, they will many times form a small hard core in the center of it. Um, and that core is just a really dense plug of keratin. And uh -huh. keratin is what your toenails are made of, very, very hard material. And so it can feel like you're walking on a, uh, a tack or a rock in your shoe. So they can be very painful. So if somebody comes in with a corn and a callus, what, what is the treatment? So, put, put some softening cream on it or what do you do? <laughs> well, uh, it, first of all, we want to look at the underlying reasoning. Why are they getting excessive pressure and friction in that location? And so the two things we want to do is reduce the thickness of the corn, obviously remove that core if we can, and then find a way to decrease the pressure or the friction that's occurring. Sometimes that can be done in shoes, sometimes inserts, and sometimes it does require surgery even. At the end of, of a toe, you shave off we do. the corns? We do. Yeah. And then you go after the problem of what caused exactly. it to try so, and so we, that. I like to give some immediate relief, shave off sure. the corn. But long term, we want to look at some other uh, avenues that might give them some permanent, permanent repair there. Let's drop down to the heel. Okay. Uh, we see lots of people that get heel pain and they end up having a word they call plantar fasciitis. <laughs> what is that? Yeah. So the word plantar fascia is just our medical terminology for this long, strong ligament on the bottom of the foot. It attaches to the heel bone and it courses all the way under the arch out to the ball of the foot. And so that ligament helps to protect from a penetrating injury that goes up into the arch yeah. of the foot. Um, but more importantly, it acts as a tether. It binds the heel and the toes together. And so when you stand and gravity wants to collapse your arch, that plantar fascia is going to resist. Well, plantar, it serves a good function. It, it, plantar fascia is a wonderful uh, structure <laughs> that we need to have. Um, when, you, when you get too much tension or stretch or pressure on the plantar fascia, it wants to become inflamed right where it attaches to the heel bone. So it makes you feel like you've got a painful heel, but the problem is the plantar fascia where it attaches a, 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 Exactly. So What do you do about that? Well, we w there's two parts to the treatment. First thing we want to do is get rid of the inflammation. And the second thing we want to do is um, decrease the underlying problem that we have in the first place. So 
to get rid of the inflammation, we're talking about anti-inflammatories. Um, that can be cortisone injections, cortisone pills, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Icing, stretching, exercises, physical therapy type of avenues. And those what, are, what does the, ice do? Well, ice is just a strong anti-inflammatory. Yeah. Cool that tissue down. and, it and it's, sort of numbs the tissue in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Too, it's the very reason we use ice after surgery, to decrease that inflammation. And of course, the inflammation makes you heal slower. So, so when people wake up in the morning and they got plantar fasciitis, that first toe, oh, it hurts oh, so, yeah. so yeah. Do, Can they massage their foot? Do they wear something at nighttime yeah. that helps stretch that yeah, plantar fasciitis? Absolutely, fascia? absolutely you can. And so people who have plantar fasciitis, that's the first thing I tell them. Before you get out of bed in the morning, I want you to stretch that arch back. Take a towel or a belt, loop it around the ball of the foot and pull back. Stretch it out before your first step. And if they do that, it feels, that first step feels so much better. A lot better. How long does it take for plantar fascia to get better? And we've taken care of pain and we've stretched it. Do we have to do anything else? Well, the, the second part of the treatment, obviously, is to try to support the underlying reason. So if you're getting too much stretch on the plantar fascia, how do you take care of that? We can do that with shoes with better arch support. We can add inserts and arch support into the shoes and various other things that we can do. Most people, when, they start, when we start treating plantar fasciitis, they can usually have pretty much complete relief in about a month. Ah. Um, now, there are some people who resist, and, the, and that can yeah. go on to be much more extensive treatment. So in general, you can tell somebody, we're going to get you better. Oh, absolutely. But you're going to have to follow the instructions. I say, I say you got about a 99.8% chance we're going to get you better without anything other than conservative treatment. Yeah, and that must make the patient really feel good. Well, they come in and they're, they're very anxious about it because it's a very painful condition. Uh, we've got an epidemic in the United States of obesity, and that brings on type 2 diabetes. And with type 2 diabetes, we get lots of foot problems. Is the diabetic foot a challenge sometimes? Oh, goodness. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking about. Yeah, it presents a challenge, but that's why we have podiatrists to help us handle those challenges and keep us from losing our feet. You'll want to stay tuned. We're talking with Dr. Kendall Ritchie, and we've been talking about bunions and calluses and corns and plantar fasciitis. The nice thing about it, a very painful and very difficult problem suddenly has a cure if you take the time to get it taken care of. Kendall, let's talk about a diabetic foot. One of the things that we warn people when they get diabetes is be very careful with your feet because if you get a problem, it may end up with a very bad story, amputation. So what do you look for in a diabetic foot and what do you do for people? Okay, that's, that's a good question. <clears throat> so there are three systems when you have diabetes in the lower extremities that will affect. The first is the circulation, causes plaque to build up in the arteries. The second is the nervous system. We're talking about neuropathy and the, the blood sugar sets off a cascade of events that damages the coating on the nerves. And the third is the immune system. Um, the, hi the high blood sugar somehow shuts down the immune system's ability to fight infection. And so when you take a person that doesn't have good circulation, has loss of feeling, and all of a sudden doesn't have a good immune system down there, that's a recipe for disaster, correct. So what do you see that the people come in with? They uh, hurt their toes, and, or yeah. they cut their feet, and they don't really take care of it, they don't know it because it doesn't seem to bother them? Or what? The, the majority of time, what we're gonna see here are probably um, friction areas, like corns, uh -huh. we talked about earlier, that will turn into something larger the friction continues and now all of a sudden that corn turns into a small ulcer. So, of course the word ulcer means there's a hole in something and so there's a hole in your skin. Um, those ulcers in turn can get infected, the infection can run deep and next thing you know you've got a, a bad situation. Yeah and you don't have a good blood supply and you've got right. uh, nothing so you, to bring the antibiotics down there yeah, you're and trouble. not enough to heal. Correct. So if somebody has an ulcer in their foot is there a common location, and what do you do for an ulcer in the foot? Yeah, I would say the, by far the most common locations for ulcers are on the toes and then under the ball of the foot, high, high traffic areas. So two things have to happen. Obviously, we have to have good wound care. And secondly, we have to find a way to offload that particular location because the pressure is the culprit here. So we're wound care. Wound care. So you've got a, an open hole there. Do you have to debris? Do you have to cover it? Do you have to put goop on it? All what? of that, all of that, <laughs> yes. So um, 
Debridement means removing the devitalized tissue, the tissue that doesn't have a, an ability to heal, and getting down to the good, healthy tissue. That's what debridement is. Then we can do that with nippers and scalpels and stuff like that. <clears throat> um, the goos that we put in, um, what we're trying to do there is decrease the bacteria that are in there so yeah. that it doesn't get infected, and then stimulate some underlying what we call granulation tissue. Granulation is the, is the good, healthy tissue. Yeah, you try and get healthy Correct. tissue to come in mm -hmm. and take, take back over. Do people, do you have them elevate their feet or do you have them walk or limit their walking? Absolutely. So we use a host of different ways to try to get them off that foot. There might be special boots that we've made. It might just be a simple orthotic, but it might be one of those rolling knee scooters or crutches or a wheelchair. They can be that bad. So can you have free... I would imagine you have to see the patient back frequently because yes. you have to know if it's going downhill right. or if it's improving. Uh, yeah, these patients, we get to be really close friends. We, we see each other every week, uh, sometimes get to know each other's families. But so um, it's, the debridement is something that has to be done very regularly. And you have to monitor, make sure that the weight is being adequately reduced from that area. So, so if somebody's got an area on the side of the foot, I would anticipate you're going to have to cover it with gauze and you're going to have to keep a shoe off that because it would do nothing yeah, but put yeah, pressure on that. Yeah, and, and we have special surgical boots and shoes that we use to cover dressings. Yeah. What happens if it's at the bottom of the foot? How do you attack staying away from that part? Well, again, that is the hardest location because every step you take, pressure goes right through that. And so once again, we try to, we try to use a combination of crutches or knee scooters. Um, you can make shoes that will elevate from the ball of the foot back to the heel so that when they stand, the pressure isn't under the ball of the foot. Um, but that's, that's not as common because that can offset your balance. Um, concerning the foot and the nails, is proper nail care important? It's, 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 it's important for everybody, but in the diabetic community, probably more so. When you don't have feeling and don't have circulation, a small ingrown toenail or a small sharp corner that's left can cut the opposite toe or into the, actually the adjacent toe. Next thing you know, that turns into infection itself. So who is the best nail cutter? The doctor? <laughs> you know, I'm pretty good on my fingernails, but when I'm trying to cut off my toenails, I don't seem to do as good. Uh, so who, is that part of the profession it, it of podiatry? Is. That is part of our profession. It's a part that um, we don't want to overlook. Um, I have trained uh, medical assistants in my office that will do that for us. Yeah. Um, obviously, everything they do is checked by me, and I do a lot of it myself as well. So. You see a lot of people, they get real thick nails mm -hmm. that almost come up and dome up. Do you have to shave those down? Can you cut those? What do you do? We do. We have a whole host of different instrumentation that we use to thin them down and cut them back. Um, I think that's fascinating. It, well, sometimes we even have to remove them, but we try, we try very hard not to do that because that's kind of traumatic. When you renew, remove a nail, how long does it take it to come back? A typical toenail will grow about one millimeter to one and a half millimeters per month. So, so you're talking about nine months to a year till you get a nail that comes completely back. Back. Yeah. So you want to take care of those nails. Well, what is an in, when you say ingrown toenail, what, is, what does that mean? Well, the word ingrown toenail basically means that the edge of the nail is pushing into the fold of flesh along the side of the nail there. And so there's two parts to it. It can be a bit of a foreign body reaction because the nail's not supposed to be in there. And so the second thing is if it cuts the flesh, then it can get infected. So you have to lift it up we, or you just have to we, cut it off? We, will, we actually remove a very small sliver off the edge of the nail. We do that right in the office and it relieves the pressure. It's like taking the thorn out of the lion's paw. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, let's go into arches. If somebody's okay. got flat feet or they've got a high arch, do you have different, what do you do for a real strong arch, a real high arch versus a flat foot? Well, obviously, it's, it's kind of the exact opposite uh, deformity, so to speak. You know, they used to say flat feet will keep you out of the military, but I think high arches should too. Um, people with high arches don't absorb shock well. So when we make inserts or what we call orthotics for um, high arches, we want to spend a lot of time adding more cushioning for those because they don't absorb shock very well. Flat feet, on the other hand, are the exact opposite. We're trying to give them some lift. And so they are, don't usually have shock absorption issues. They have more mechanical um, arthritic type problems. Which is easier to, to support the patient, 
The one with the bad high arch or with a bad flat front? Oh, it, it depends on how extreme. In my opinion, most of the time, the high arched people actually have more problems than the flat footed people. Sprains in athletic injuries. Yes, yeah, oh. see them all the time. <laughs> I, so you have to look at each one and find out if what's gone wrong, what will go wrong with somebody sprains an ankle. Do they stretch tendons? Do they tear tendons? Yeah. Uh, what do you do? Well, there's, there's obviously various levels of a sprain. You can have just a stretched ligament, and most of the time those will heal nicely with rest, ice, and elevation. Um, you can have partially torn ligaments. Uh, when that happens, that can be more extensive, much more bruising, much more swelling. It takes a lot longer time to heal. And then you can have complete ruptures of those ligaments, and that becomes very unstable. And in that case, you might end up with extensive rehabilitation or even surgery for repair for those. So what I'm hearing is a podiatrist has to know a huge amount of information on the millions of things that can go wrong with a foot. What is the education of a podiatrist? Well, basically we have a four-year medical degree. Um, at the end of four years, almost all podiatrists go for postgraduate training, some type of a residency. Um, I think the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeries uh, at this point is requiring three years of uh, postdoctorate training. Wow. So. Wow. Um, you're a great teacher, Kendall oh, Ricky, and I really have enjoyed having you on the Dr. Bob Show. I didn't really realize till I started looking at how many different problems that you have to be educated in and know how to help patients. Must be a great feeling. Oh, thank you. I, I, I enjoy every day. I hope, so. hope you'll come back again. I would love to. Thank you very much. <laughs> great Sorry. show, a lot, of, a lot of information, now you're going to want to stay tuned, we'll talk about signs and symptoms of anemia, and we'll shortly touch on heart ablation. I want to thank Dr. Kendall Ritchie, wonderful discussions on how to treat problems with the foot. Now, questions from you, the viewer, that I think will be important to your health, Dr. Bob. What are some signs and symptoms of anemia? My neighbor says I look pale. Well, paleness is one of the things because anemia is where the red blood cells are deficient. There's not enough red blood cells and the red blood cells carry oxygen around to the rest of the body to nourish the body. What can cause anemia? Sometimes it's the formation of an abnormal red blood cell that dies off easily. That would be like sickle cell anemia. There's some large red blood cell anemia, pernicious anemia. Or it could be blood loss. It could be ulcers with quiet bleeding. Or it could be some GI bleeding. So there are lots of reasons for people to have anemia. The symptoms are usually shortness of breath, tired, pale, you're fatigued, you have no energy. Well, a lot of people don't have energy. But part of the evaluation of fatigue is getting a blood count. If you're hemoglobin and you're hematocrit, the two measures of anemia, if they're abnormal, then we have to find the, the cause and then we can find the cure. Question number two, Dr. Bob, what is heart ablation? More and more we hear about the word ablation. The most common irregular heart rhythm is atrial fibrillation. And a lot of times with atrial fibrillation, we can try medications and sometimes cardioversion. But atrial fibrillation occurs in a certain chamber of the heart called the left atrium. In the left atrium, we can do a cath, go up in the left atrium, find the areas that are triggering atrial fibrillation. And then we can either use laser to burn the sites and cause scarring, or we can use cold that also injures the tissue there and will cause scarring. When that happens, those are the areas that excite the left atrium that trigger off atrial fibrillation. Normally, that left atrium beats 70 times a minute. The heart beats 70 times a minute. But with atrial fibrillation, the left atrium may be beating 300 times a minute because of those areas of excitation. Ablation is the way that we can stop that. So if your doctor, if the medicines don't work, uh, if it comes time to ablation, they will explain that to you and they'll explain 
why it needs to be done. With atrial fibrillation, we fe frequently have to be on medications and we have to be on blood thinners because it's a common cause of getting a blood clot in the heart that goes up to the brain, common cause of stroke. Remember those four things we like in the Dr. Bob show? It's that exercise. Are you exercising enough? enough? Be sure and get those tennis shoes out, start walking, enjoy exercise with somebody else, eat properly, start the day off with a good breakfast. Breakfast is very important. Fruit, fiber for breakfast, eat less as the day goes on, get seven and a half hours sleep. Too often, we just don't take time to take time to sleep. So if you need seven and a half hours sleep, which is the common length of time we need, count back from when you have to wake up and when you go to bed. If you've got things that are keeping you from sleeping well, talk that over with your doctor, but get that seven and a half hour sleep. And most of all, and I think the most important thing is laughter in your life. Find somebody you can giggle with. When you laugh a lot, your immune system works better. You'll stay happier. People around with you will be happier and the world will be a better place. If you stay happy, you'll stay healthy.